Welcome to another episode of the Love to Move podcast, where we take a look at all the definitions of the word move and tell you why we love them. On today's episode, we're looking at maybe the absence of moving, which is sleep, something that we have to do every single day. Yes, I know, even for you insomniacs. Speaking of insomnia, that is exactly what we're going to be talking about, battling, because you do need to sleep so that you can move better throughout the rest of your day and life. My guest this week is Lana Walsh, and she has had her own battle with insomnia, which might rival some of the ones that you might be thinking you're having. She brings in a lot of very interesting, if not controversial, ideas that I think are very beneficial to us. So if you've been struggling with sleep or know somebody who struggles with sleep, this episode is for you so that you can be rested and ready for the rest of the day. So please help me in welcoming Lana Walsh. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to talk about sleep. I know you and I uh, before on, on the, the pre uh, recording call talks about how what does what sleep have anything to do with movement and I immediately was like sleep is what you need to do so you can move <laughs> it's it's so incredibly important I know we're going to talk about sleep your journey of figuring out how to deal with insomnia and I think so many people now especially with uh, social media and everything like that what I hear is people are always on their phones and I can't get enough sleep I'm overstimulated I I, I can't be doing it I uh, one of your posts was fantastic where it was, um, uh, I believe, insomnia is a glamorous term for the thoughts you forgot to have throughout the day, something along those lines. And I thought, oh, yes, <laughs> because the mind is always racing. So I am excited to talk about sleep, but I would like to start how, of how did you get into all of this? How did you get into the realm of having to learn about sleep and and everything that comes with it? Yeah, um, I tell my story all the time because I get this question every time I talk to somebody. How do you become a sleep expert? <laughs> it comes from spending 30 years not sleeping, basically. I spent 30 years struggling to sleep through the night, and I started having trouble when I was a kid. I remember at 12 or 13 years old getting out of bed and having to rearrange my pajamas because they got wrapped so tight around me from all the tossing and turning. Uh, as a teenager, my parents thought I was, you know, typical teenager, grumpy, irritable, didn't want to get up in the morning, didn't want to go to school, um, sleeping in on the weekend, staying up too late, you know, just typical teenage stuff. But the truth was I was tossing and turning all night long because I had restless leg syndrome. Now, restless leg syndrome is an uncontrollable urge to move your legs. And when you try to control the motion, you get a pain sensation. Now, people describe it differently. It could be like an itching or a tingling sensation. But for me, it feels like a burning in my thighs. And the only way to stop the burning sensation is to actually move. So sometimes I'd be up in the night doing squats and high knees and kickbacks, just trying to work that energy out so I could go to sleep. But it gets worse with fatigue. So at night, when you're trying to sleep and you can't, then your legs really go crazy and they're just driving you insane. So that's what makes it a sleep disorder. And as my life went on, I didn't get the restless leg diagnosed, and I continued to have trouble, trouble sleeping. I had trouble getting up, going to work. I had trouble at work. I had was nodding off in the afternoons. I'll tell you a story about that a little later. I was nodding off at work. I was having difficulty concentrating. I would be blonde all day because I just didn't know what to do. My brain fog was so bad. And all of this time, I was seeing doctors. I was going to... I went to a sleep clinic because they thought I had sleep apnea, which I don't. I saw a sleep expert who just talked to me about my symptoms for restless leg because at that point I already knew I had it. He asked me about my restless leg, diagnosed that, gave me a pill for it. Go to my regular doctor. I can't sleep. They give me a pill for that. I go to my regular doctor every six months to a year, refill prescription, refill prescription, refill prescription. Not one of those experts actually asked me about what I was doing at night. How, like, what were my habits? What did I think about my sleep? What was I doing when I couldn't sleep? There was any conversation specifically about my sleep. And I self-diagnosed insomnia. And I did all the Google searches. You know, I was reading as much information as I could find. And I couldn't find the answer. And I was trying everything. This is something I hear from my clients all the time. 
I'm trying everything. I've done it all. I've turned off my devices. I'm getting exercise. I'm eating right. I have a routine. I'm like, all of these things and nothing's working. And that's exactly how I felt. And it came to me, I say by accident, but maybe by divine intervention, I finally found the solution. And now that I know how my insomnia started, the proper reasons why you do certain things, like the understanding sleep, I was able to overcome my insomnia. But that led me to really wanting to help as many people as I could who are just like me, who have just been struggling for years and decades just like me so that they can get themselves back on track because it does make it, it's like a 180 degree difference. It has absolutely transformed my life being able to sleep through the night. So yeah, it's just been, it's been a long struggle um, that I'm so glad it's over. It's it's wonderful to hear that it's over. Uh, I think there there might be people listening that go, "Oh my goodness, I wish mine was over." How we'll get to the how we will. I promise. And I know you. Uh, we're we're going to talk about some breathing things and some tapping things that might help of of things that people can use. But something that immediately jumps out to me that I don't want us to completely blow past. We'll get into the sleep things. Is a lot of people, at least especially in my youth, would say, "Oh yes, they have restless leg. They have restless leg." And really, it was more just fidgeting. The person was just fidgeting. Their leg was bouncing up and down. I think the important key that I, I took away from you is restless leg syndrome. There's pain. There's an extra sensation if you don't move. It's not just a, a child or somebody who can't sit still. That's different. That's not restless leg. And let's not kind of throw that diagnosis around willy nilly um, and, and, and really understand that. Because, I mean, it could be you're burning. How intense was it? Was that burning truly painful? Was it kind of like a nerve burning? Can you describe how the burning would build if you didn't move? It It's absolutely unbearable. That's what makes it that desire and need to move. Even when you're unconscious, your legs are moving because it's that, that need. It's, it's not just a need. It's, um, it's part of the brain, actually. It's the same part of the brain that controls Parkinson's controls restless leg syndrome. So the treatment for restless leg is a Parkinson's drug. And that's what I went on originally. But it is so intense that you... Um, okay, so here's how I describe it. For people, like if you have claustrophobia and you, and you think about being stuck in a in a position where you can't move that claustrophobic like feeling, that feeling is a lot like what I feel with my restless leg. It's like this, I'm just going to explode if I don't get out of this situation. And even thinking about claustrophobia actually triggers my legs. Like right now, just having this conversation, I can feel my legs starting to get a little bit, you know, this, I don't feel good right now. <laughs> So my knee is going to start bouncing here right away. But yeah, it's just really, it's so intense that you, you can't control it. Even unconsciously, you can't, your legs will be kicking in the middle of the night. So if you're sleeping with somebody else, they might tell you that you're kicking them in the middle of the night. <laughs> Fair. Uh, did the Parkinson's medication help uh, with the restless leg syndrome at all? Uh, to be honest, I'm not sure. Um, I mean, maybe it was helping a little bit at night. I was taking it, um, it's a controlled release, so it slowly works through the night. And I was on a long flight overnight once, and I thought, I'll take the drugs to see if that helps keep them calm. And I found I was still struggling through that flight. So I'm not sure if it was, you know, maybe it works when you're sleeping and it helps reduce that need to kick around. But when I was consciously awake, I, it just really was a struggle. Is that a, a, a scary kind of realization? W was there any point where you're going, does this mean I have Parkinson's? Or w was there ever a battle of that in your mind? Uh, no, there's no relation to Parkinson's. I'm not predisposed to Parkinson's. I don't have Parkinson's. It's just the same region of the brain that is controlling the motion. So no, I'm, I'm not worried about that. <laughs> Okay, good. Well, let's move on on to the to the sleep part. I think we should uh, first tackle some of the more general questions that I'm sure you've been asked a lot, but just to to level the playing field for everybody uh, before they're going. But he didn't ask. Um, 
So one of the things undoubtedly that you're probably asked all the time is how many hours of sleep do we really need? And I'm sure you're going to say it depends. Um, so give us a little bit more detail um, so people can have a little more takeaway. Okay. Yeah. It, and it really does depend, but we'll start with the minimum. So there has been some research um, called core sleep. They did this research with um, transatlantic solo yacht racers. Um, sorry, students who were give me a second. <clears throat> um, students who were restricting their hours. Physicians or resident physicians and insomniacs who typically average about five and three quarter hours of sleep. And this research found that five and a half hours is really the minimum amount of sleep that we're required to have in order to maintain our, you know, bodily functions and our brain and our productivity and ability to function. But for most of us, that's not really, we don't feel very good on that core amount of sleep. We, most of us need a little bit more. And that comes to the next part, which is your sleep needs are genetic. So they found a gene, the PER3 gene, which shows how long it is, is really what your body and what you need for sleep. So we all know people, there's like uh, several U.S. presidents and other um, big CEOs that will say, I only need five hours of sleep and I feel great. And we also know people on the other end that are saying, I need nine or 10 hours of sleep or I'm, I'm useless. So really, how much sleep you need is genetic. As long as you're getting that five and a half hours of sleep, you're getting enough. But you should judge how well you feel for how much sleep you need. So if you wake up regularly only getting six hours of sleep and you feel tired in the morning, you have to drag yourself out of bed, um, you're feeling like you have to nod off in the evenings or the afternoons, then you're likely not getting enough sleep. And then you'll want to make sure you're going to bed a little bit earlier. So that's my judge when I tell people, um, you know, stop looking at the number of hours you're getting and really feel how you are, like, take a scan of your body. How do you feel when you wake up? Are you dragging yourself out of bed? Or do you wake up going, okay, I'm rested, I'm ready to go? That's really the judge on if you're getting enough sleep or not. Now, there's also, if you have a sleep disorder, um, sleep apnea, insomnia, restless leg syndrome. It doesn't matter how many hours of sleep you're getting. If those are affecting your sleep, you could get 20 hours of sleep and still feel unrested. <laughs> so it's really about, you know, if you're sleeping through the night, you don't have any other sleep disorders and you wake up and you don't feel rested, then maybe go to bed a half hour or an hour earlier. I think. And that's really, it's best. You're the best judge. I really like that. I like that you are the best judge. And it, it, just because somebody else gets away with six or seven hours, I I really dislike seeing it, especially now in hustle culture and a lot of these kind of things where they're like, you don't need to sleep. Rich people don't sleep eight hours a day. It, there are plenty of rich people that sleep eight hours a day. Um, it's that's it's a myth. Sure, there are also plenty of people that don't. They sleep, like you said, five and a half, six hours. There are also those. Um, and it's what you can kind of feel with. Is there a thing, because for me, the way I tend to judge it is if I've had enough sleep, if I'm, because sometimes the bed is so comfortable, it's just so nice, and maybe I just want to lay there. But if I'm waking up every, you know, 10, 15, or even five minutes again and again and again in the morning, and it's happened two or three times without any alarm or anything, I go, okay, get up. Like your body's telling you I'm done sleeping just because it feels nice to be here. But is there a thing of sleeping too much? Can we go past the amount um, where it's like, okay, you start feeling groggy because you've overslept? Um, yeah, that does happen. And I think what happens is, especially on the weekends, people get into this, you know, like you were saying, the hustle culture during the week, they're getting up early, they're staying up late. And on the weekends, they think, oh, well, I'll just sleep in and catch up. Well, there's no such thing as catching up with sleep. And so when you sleep in, all you're doing is you're just you're just affecting your circadian rhythm. You're just you're screwing up your whole time schedule. 
and you're making it worse for yourself. So lots of people who are like early risers during the week and they sleep in on the weekend, they always find that they're less productive, have less energy. And it's because your energy level naturally fluctuates throughout the day. And if you're naturally really productive in the morning, if you delay that on the weekend, you're just, you're screwing up, I guess is the best way to say your natural rhythm. And now you're going to find yourself totally off kilter and it's not going to feel right or natural because you've just screwed up your natural, your natural rhythm. Mm -hmm. So it's really, it's about getting consistent sleep. But the most important part about consistent sleep is always getting up at the same time every day. So if you stay up late on the weekend, because that's what you like to do, instead of sleeping in the next morning, get up close to the normal time and have a nap. You will actually have more energy that day. You'll feel better that day by getting up at your regular time and having a nap or going to bed a little bit earlier that night so you can get your cycle back on track. How long does it, if, if you're saying, okay, I, I'm going to start setting a specific time because my times are all over the place. Sometimes I'll get up at seven, sometimes nine, sometimes six, sometimes eight. And I say, okay, that's it. I'm going to get up at seven every single morning. How long is it going to take me to finally get into the groove where my body starts going? Okay. Seven is the time that I now feel that we're generally getting up. And if you do anything else, that's when I feel thrown off. Well, I guess it depends on, it it really, I guess it depends. Most people can start, you know, you'll naturally start waking up at seven o'clock. You know, within a week or two, you'll start to naturally waking up at that time. As long as you're consistent, you're waking up at that time, the alarm's going off and you're getting up, you know, within 20 to 30 minutes of waking up and you're getting out of bed and you're going about your day and you're going to bed at the same time, generally every night your body will naturally fall into that rhythm of waking up naturally. And that's what I try to get all my clients to is let's start waking up naturally at the right time instead of all these other times that you're waking up. And because your circadian rhythm is a 24 hour clock and it runs on a 24 hour clock, regardless if you disrupt that time. So when you get up later, what you're doing is you end up wanting to go to bed later. So that because you've delayed your circadian rhythm. So then the next day when you want to get up earlier, it's a struggle because you haven't been in bed as long as you normally would be. So then you get up earlier and then you feel more tired throughout the day, more sleepy. And then you want to go to bed earlier. And then, of course, the next day you're like, oh, well, now I don't know if I can sleep as late as I wanted to because it's really disrupting your clock. So sticking to that rhythm, your body wants to be on a rhythm. It's already set to a 24 hour clock. So as long as you're sticking to it, in a couple of weeks, you should be naturally waking up on time all the time. Mm -hmm. Uh, I am, this is possibly my ignorance here. I would thought that there, uh, that the circadian rhythm kind of is more along a a 25 hour cycle, or does it seem to to be on got 24 or is it somewhere in between? I think the research says it's like 24 and a quarter hours. but for most people, it resets every day. So you're like most people don't end up, you know, so many days down the road, you know, all of a sudden they're waking up an hour later because their circadian rhythm was 15 minutes past the 24 hour cycle. Mm-hmm. It, it resets itself at night. So the circadian rhythm, there's a number of functions that happen with your body throughout a 24 hour cycle. And The most important one is you have this body temperature rise and fall. So when you get up in the morning, sunlight or bright light hits your eyes, your brain goes, okay, we're awake, time to turn off the melatonin, and your body temperature starts to rise. And in that 24-hour period, your body temperature can fluctuate one to two degrees. And about late afternoon or early evening, you hit the highest body temperature, and then your body temperature stops to drop. And then that's a signal to the brain, hey, we're going to be getting ready to go to sleep here in a few hours. So let's start preparing. And then about two hours before you would normally go to bed, your melatonin production begins and your body starts to slow down 
And then when you go to sleep, you know, digestion slows down, bowel functions are stopped, you know, all kinds of things happen at night while you sleep. And then that whole process starts again when you wake up the next morning. So it's, it's not just, you know, sleep and wake. There's other things that are happening as part of that rhythm that are keeping it on time. But it's also one of the reasons why when you travel, it's so hard to get yourself into the new time zone because your rhythm is just out of whack. And so then getting it back into cycle requires doing things that you normally would do. Like, you know, when you get up, how quickly do you eat your first meal? So you want to start when you're traveling, that's how you get your rhythm on track is to eat within the same time frames as you normally would at home. That's one of the things you can do to help get your cycle back on track. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's more, more, there's so much function to your rhythm and keeping it on, on schedule. And so in terms of that rhythm, is it also going to be ideally if there's not a, a crazy time difference, um, something like, you know, eight hours, but if it's maybe one, two or three hours, is it getting up at the time that you would have gotten up in your original time zone? Would that be technically better? Um, than trying to get up at the at the time difference zone, if that makes sense? I guess it depends on how long you're going to be there for and what you need to do while you're there. Um, it, and it's really hard, you know, one, one or two hours probably isn't that hard depending on what you're doing. If you're there for a conference, then you're going to have to get on the right schedule. But if you're there for vacation, it probably wouldn't matter so much. And if you're only there for a couple of days, it doesn't matter so much. But if you're going to be there for a couple of weeks, then you're going to want to get in into that rhythm mm-hmm. of what works there. And it's, you know, one or two time zones isn't too much, um, isn't too difficult. Really, moving one or two time zones is basically what people do on the weekends, right? They sleep in an extra, you know, one or two or three hours on the weekend, and then come Monday, they're back on regular schedule. So it, it's basically the same as sleeping in on the weekends and getting back to regular on Monday. So one or two time zones is it is it too much of a difference? I I never thought about it that way. That's absolutely true. That is what we do uh, on the weekends. A very interesting way um, to think about it. Uh, I have an interesting almost case study for you. Um, I'm going to put you very very marginally on the spot, but I just think it's it's interesting of all the insight that you'll be able to provide to this. So several years ago, um, I got a parasite in my eye. And as part of the medication, uh, I had to put in three drops into my eye every hour, every single hour. And you had to do five minutes in between. So the most I could ever sleep for was 45 minutes at a time. That's it. Uh, And that was for about a month and a half until they finally said, okay, you can now do every two hours at night. Um, And so usual sleep cycle from my understanding about 90 minutes so obviously with 45 minutes I wasn't getting the whole thing what were the things that were possibly happening to my body and 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 that weren't weren't being allowed to fully go through because I wasn't getting a full sleep cycle and only sleeping at 45 minute intervals what was what was happening to me (laughs) wow that's that's pretty intense and for a month and a half were you Absolutely. I just want to ask, were you absolutely exhausted every day? Uh, Yes. Well, the thing about it was that I was very light sensitive at that point. So the room was kept entirely dark the the entire time as well. So I know most of the day I just spent in bed. Uh, So I was kind of just in and out of sleep the majority of the time. Now it's a blur to to, to think of that memory. But yes, I was pretty exhausted the entire time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, a normal sleep cycle of 90 minutes, there's five stages of sleep. Uh, the most important stage of sleep is deep sleep, which usually occurs around 45 minutes into a sleep cycle. So, however, our um, the sleep studies show on this core sleep research that your brain is designed to make up deep sleep, at least 100% of deep sleep, and at least 50% of REM sleep, if you miss out on those two sleep stages, because it is absolutely essential. So likely, what was happening for you is in some of those 45-minute sections, you would go immediately into deep sleep or REM sleep, 
because your brain has to have it. But not having that full sleep cycle and always being woken up, that's, you know, one of the things that could happen with insomnia. And it does make your sleep less restful because, you know, you can go a certain amount of days um, having really broken up limited sleep without it affecting your ability to perform or your health. Um, but at some point, you really do need a good stretch of sleep. So you were probably feeling a lot of exhaustion. You were probably feeling like you weren't very strong. You may have felt like a little, a lot of anxiety. You probably felt um, like you were having a hard time, like functioning, thinking, concentrating, focusing, um, being able to hold conversations. You might have had trouble with memory. Right. Um, your reflexes would have been really reduced, like almost like being impaired. There may have been some other things going on in your body. I know there's, you know, um, higher chance of diabetes, stroke, heart attack with long term, uh, really restricted sleep like that. Um, so I'm, I'm just not sure about that, but um, those could be some of the things that were happening to your body. Definitely many of those. Uh, remembering back to it, absolutely. And the, a point on the exhaustion is I, I did say that there came a point when they said, OK, every two hours um, during the night, <laughs> that first night. And I had I had this alarm clock and it was it was these I thought it was it would be nice. It was these little birds chirping that would go off every hour. Hated them very quickly. Um, wanted to strangle every single one of them. Not really, but it was it was very annoying. But that first night that they allowed me to sleep and get the full sleep cycle, I think I slept. I slept through most of those alarms. I think I slept for four four or five hours because the body was just going what? Yes, c catch up on all that. And it's true because uh, I, from what I understand, you're you're getting dreams and everything is during that deep and REM sleep. And I was definitely having dreams at those times. So undoubtedly, my brain was catching up. And that's nice to hear um, that there there was some of that happening because I, I was thinking, well, that's it. Ruined my brain forever. Uh, it's good to hear that our body can adapt so well. When it comes to insomnia, um, undoubtedly, there's this issue of I can't fall asleep or I can't stay asleep, uh, usually even if you kind of fall asleep and, and get into it. Is there is there a different way of kind of treating the, the, those two types? Are there other types of insomnia or maybe there's a different categories of insomnia that I'm not getting at? Let's talk about that. Sure. So the basic definition of insomnia is taking an hour or more to go to sleep, which is sleep onset insomnia, or to go back to sleep after waking during the night, that sleep maintenance insomnia. You can have either of those kinds or both at the same time at different points in your life because of stress typically. Stress is the number one reason people can't sleep. And when I'm doing presentations, I'll ask, you know, have any has anybody ever felt that way? Had a night where they couldn't sleep for an hour or more, right? And uh, yeah, exactly. And um, everybody has. And it doesn't mean you have a problem with insomnia that you would want to come see someone like me. However, if it's going on three or more times per week and it's been going on for more than a few months, that's when it falls into the chronic definition of insomnia. So that's when you want to start maybe considering really working on what's happening. And if you also perceive a detrimental consequence to your in your day because of your sleep, so if you feel stressed, anxious, unproductive, unmotivated, unfocused, all kinds of things because you had a bad night's sleep. That's in the clinical definition of insomnia. Now, you know, lots of people, and and I totally think it's all right for this to happen, that when you're in an extremely stressful situation, um, there's a, been a death, there's a financial crisis, divorce, anything like that, um, it's totally normal to have trouble sleeping and have trouble sleeping for a number of days in a week, number of weeks. And I totally agree that if you go to your doctor and get sleeping pills at that time, that that's, that's totally normal. But really, I highly recommend that you consider only taking those pills, you know, every other day, every third day, and only do that for a couple of weeks just to get you back on track. 
And this is where I saw the problem with myself. I found that I was um, having trouble sleeping because I was under stress. So I went to the doctor, got the pills. And then there was never any conversation at any point about stopping the pills and figuring out what was wrong. So, you know, if you're going to take pills, it's during a really stressful time, that's okay. And be okay with that. But just know, promise yourself to not do it every day and to stop them, you know, after a couple of weeks. Now, for once you're in that, you know, clinical, chronic insomnia, and you want to fix that, whether you have sleep onset insomnia or sleep maintenance insomnia, the treatment options are pretty much the same. Um, what I do is called CBTI, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy for Insomnia. It's on the premise that insomnia is a learned behavior. So what happens is we're in a stressful situation, typically, very stressful situation. We have trouble sleeping. We start to get anxious and frustrated about our sleep. We start to worry that we're not going to be able to sleep. We start saying things like, oh, my God, am I ever going to sleep? I'm so exhausted. I must be able to sleep tonight. Come on now, body, just do it. <laughs> and you get into bed and you toss and turn, toss and turn, and you can't sleep. And over time, your subconscious brain learns, just like Pavlov's dog, that the bed is not for sleeping. And so subconsciously, your brain starts to think that the bed is meant for doing other things. And it's all those things that are spinning out in your mind at night. It's the, um, you know, worries, the anxieties, you know, the to-do list, replaying conversations in your mind, you know, thinking about all those things that are stressing you out or making you anxious. Being creative, that's one of the things that I get into at night. So your brain starts to learn that that's what you're supposed to do at night. We're not here to sleep. We're here to think about something. We're here to worry about this. We're here to figure out why that conversation went off the rails. And so then it comes down to the treatment being getting you back on track with learning to sleep through the night consistently. And with CBTI, that's a process of stress reduction and relaxation techniques, sleep education, and then specific strategies, what to do at night to get you through the night so that you can sleep consistently. The good news is it actually works pretty fast. I typically work with clients for six weeks. And by the end of six weeks, my clients are you know, their sleep is 70% better <laughs> or, or even have cured their insomnia in just six weeks. So it really does, it's very effective and it works really quickly if you know the right process. And that's really what it came down to for me, trying all of these things that you're reading about, but not in a proper order and a few things not knowing about. <laughs> It's really, that's what it comes down to, just really understanding how things work and putting it in the right order so that it can be effective and get you back on track. Before we get more into the CBT side of it, I just want to make a, a clarification. Um, when you were talking about sleeping pills, um, is that melatonin or is that something stronger than melatonin? And if it is not melatonin, how do you feel about melatonin? I'm guessing it's the same way of use it to get back on track, but don't use because your body already produces melatonin. So don't just take external melatonin. Um, can you make a distinction between those? Sure. So when, yeah, when I'm talking about sleeping pills, I mean like, you know, an over the counter drug, a Tylenol PM or, you know, going to your doctor for Ambien or, or something like that. You know, if that's what you need to do to get some sleep while you're in that stressful situation, then it's okay to do that. But just know you want to make sure that you do that very small amount of time. Melatonin is, is a different thing. Melatonin is a hormone. So first of all, so when you take a supplement, you're taking a synthetic hormone, just like a, just like um, birth control, the synthetic hormone. So you, that's something to be aware of. Your body produces only 0.3 milligrams naturally each day. The average over the counter is one to three milligrams. So you're overdosing. The other thing is there, there's no research out there to support melatonin 
as a treatment option for insomnia specifically. There is some support, like if you're in a shift work situation, if you're um, traveling and you've gone, you know, five, six time zones away, melatonin can sometimes help you with going to sleep. So there's a number of things that are happening with melatonin, with people using melatonin. And one of them is they're taking it too much. They are taking it at the wrong time. It doesn't make you sleepy. Its role is to regulate your sleep-wake cycle. So when people are taking it right at bedtime, it actually, you know, naturally starts production two hours before bedtime. So if you're going to take it, that's when you should take it. Um, and it's just, and it's a synthetic hormone that's an over-the-counter health food store product. So it's not as regulated as like birth control. Birth control is highly regulated, very well researched. Um, there's all kinds of things that they do with birth control, but with melatonin, it doesn't follow into that same category. So when I talk to people, I'm usually like, you know, it's much better for you to just get outside and get some sunlight because sunlight and darkness, the two combined, are really important for regulating your sleep weight cycle and will do so much more for you in that regulation process than taking melatonin or coffee in the afternoon or anything to keep you going. It's really more sunlight, more darkness at night. Those are the two things that will be better for you. Uh, absolutely. And uh, for those that think that uh, a screen or the the lights in your house are anything equal to the sunlight, it's not uh, just by the lux, the, the measurement of the amount of light. It's ridiculous how much more powerful sunlight is. Get out there. It's free. It's there. It's there every day. Um, so just, just, just go. Uh, absolutely wonderful. So to, to clarify for the melatonin, if somebody goes, okay, no, I, I really do like using melatonin. It's good for me make sure that you double check and you're not taking something like two or three milligrams that you're on way below the one milligram if you can find it and also take it one to two hours, probably two hours before you're actually planning to go to sleep. So that, and and again, yes, with the caveat of ideally wean off of it, but if you are going to do it, that's how you can kind of do it, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, and, it, and it's like, it's kind of like drugs too. There's this psychological dependence that we get from melatonin. Your body is probably naturally producing enough melatonin for you. But psychologically, you're like, no, I, that, that's going to help me. Like I hear from people all the time. Oh, yeah, I need more. I need more. I need, I need to take this. Well, do you really or are you just thinking you do? And what if you just thought I can sleep without it instead of, oh, I can't sleep unless I have it? change that thought process to, you know what, you can sleep without it. It's probably not helping you as much as you think it is. <laughs> so just change that, just that, that thought process. That's one of the things I do with my clients too. It's about having the proper thought um, belief in your ability to sleep. And that's one of the processes that I take my clients through too, is like, let's talk about the truth about sleep so you can know the truth about you can sleep. So that's just change that thought process. I, I love it. I'm I'm currently making my way through the book, um, Psycho Cybernetics, and it's all about self-image. And it more and more, you, I'm just seeing everything out there of, yes, there, there's so much that our brain can do in terms of just the belief of, well, you know, my whole family, we've just never gone to sleep before 1 a.m. That's just how we are. It's it's not well, not necessarily that, that you believe that. I, I believe that you believe that. Um, so wonderful. I, I know that we were going to get into possibly a little bit of tapping, something that people can kind of use for that. So maybe walk us through of, of how it works, why it works, and then we can maybe get into a little bit of a demonstration. Uh, hopefully, I won't fall asleep in the middle of the, the episode, but we'll, we'll see. I'm standing up, so hopefully I'll, I'll be nice and awake. Yeah. You know, I, people say that to me all the time. I'm like, no, no, my job is not to put you to sleep right now. <laughs> At least I hope I'm not too mon monotonal and, you know, making you sleepy. So, okay, tapping is an energy psychology. It's been around for about 30 years. Um, it takes the ancient Chinese medicine of acupuncture and makes it, turns it into like a self-help, relaxation, stress reduction strategy. And it's using your fingertips to lightly tap on various acupressure points on your face, your body, and your head. And 
what it does is it helps one, it helps you sort of access your subconscious brain, right? Your conscious brain and your subconscious brain don't talk to each other, but it helps you to access a bit of your subconscious brain and to calm your nervous system down. And what it's designed to do is to remove emotional attachment to stressful events or things that are happening in your life. That's really what you're trying to get to with tapping. So you can have a memory that maybe is really stressful to you. You can have that memory without having that stress response. That's the goal of using tapping. And it's really highly effective. There's been lots of studies um, that compare it to EMDR and CBT, CBT and different things. And it shows that tapping is really effective. It's very quick and effective and usually longer lasting to being able to remove that stress and anxiety feeling. So, and it's really simple. I usually take people through um, at this really actually amazing demonstration called constricted breathing. But first, let me just share with you what the tapping points are. So the first point is on the side of the hand right here. And you can tap on either hand. It doesn't matter whichever is comfortable to you. The second point is right where your eyebrow starts by your nose. And again, you can tap either hand or both. And then on the side of the eye, it's right on the bone there and under the eye, right on the bone below the eye, under the nose. And we got the chin and the collarbone, the points of your collarbone here, just below that. And then under the arm for the ladies, this is right where the bra strap is, or you can cross your arm under if that's more comfortable, and top of the head. Now, you can do these points in any order. Um, you can miss the points. It's not really about the order or the points. It's really about um, taking a moment to give yourself permission to feel what you're feeling and to actively start to release that emotion by tapping on some or all of the points. So lots of people you'll see, like they rub their chest here. This is, this is one of those acupressure points where people like, they just naturally do it and it's actually calming their nervous system down. So you could, you know, in a meeting, you could even just like rub your temple here where people won't think you're weird because you're tapping on weird spots. But you could just rub that point on your temple and it could help calm you down. If you're like feeling really anxious about what's happening in a meeting, you know, people won't think you're weird by you. They may just think you have a headache. <laughs> so just a simple act like that can help calm your nervous system down. All right. So let's do this demonstration. So take a couple of deep breaths. All right, now I want you to take a deep breath and I want you to take a bit of a measurement on how full you're making your lungs. One being not hardly getting any air, 10 being fully expanding the lungs. Okay, now give it a number one to 10. I'm about an eight, actually, I feel pretty good. So where are you? I think I'm about a seven, yeah. Seven, okay, so let's start. So we start on the side of the hand and just repeat after me. Even though I have this constricted breathing. Even though I have this constricted breathing. I accept this feeling right now. I accept this feeling right now. Even though I have this constricted breathing. Even though I have this constricted breathing. I accept this feeling right now. I accept this feeling right now. Even though I have this constricted breathing. Even though I have this constricted breathing, I accept this feeling right now. I accept this feeling right now. Okay, eyebrow. Constricted breathing. Constricted breathing. Side of the eye. Constricted breathing. Constricted breathing. Under the eye. Constricted breathing. Constricted breathing. 
under the nose. Constricted breathing. Constricted breathing. Chin. Constricted breathing. Constricted breathing. Collarbone. Constricted breathing. Constricted breathing. Under the arm. Constricted breathing. Constricted breathing. On top of the head. Constricted breathing. Constricted breathing. All right, now take a deep breath and do the measurements again. Oh, I'm a nine. <laughs> yeah. I feel like 10, I, I have always on these uh, scales, 10, 10 to me is like, okay, this, this should blow your mind. If it's a 10, it should be the most like biggest breath you've ever taken. So, but this is probably mm -hmm. as big of a breath as I would normally ever take. And it's, it's easy now. And I, I, I think a lot of it was as we were tapping, my shoulders were relaxing. Everything was just, I was like, oh, okay, calm down. It's okay. You're just breathing. Um, yeah. And so th that was for the breath. Is that for the insomnia, would you be thinking about the breath or you're thinking about just any, any of the stressful thoughts or how would you guide it for yourself? Yeah. So when it comes to working on, so one of the things that I take my clients through the very first week, the only thing we work on is reducing stress and anxiety. Mm -hmm. And I always teach them tapping as one of the ways they can use to reduce stress and anxiety because it, it was actually the first thing I did. Before I learned about CBTI, I learned about tapping. I started using it every day. And after a few weeks, I started to notice I was sleeping better. So I highly recommend it for people. Um, but what you do is you would think about something stressful that happened that day. And, you know, if it's still causing you some trouble, you want to tap on it. So you would get to, you know, the emotion that you were feeling around that stressor. So, um, so, okay, I'll just do an example. I was a little bit stressed out about coming on the show <laughs> and talking to you because, you know, when you're doing a public talk, it can be anxiety producing. So then what I do is I ask myself, okay, I'm nervous about talking on the show. So how, how does that feel in my body? Like, where am I feeling that stress and anxiety? And for me, I feel it in my stomach. I get this like, clenching in my stomach and so I, I give that a number so let's say I'm at about a four on the scale of one to ten one being I'm not stressed at all ten being I am so stressed I want to throw up that's your scale and this is not it doesn't have to be perfect like whatever your gut instinct is telling you that what the number is so right now I'm saying I'm at about a four so then you start with tapping on the side of your hand by saying the even though statement the even though statement is about even though I feel this way, I'm giving myself permission to feel this way. So many times when we're under stress and anxiety, we beat ourselves up for being stressed or anxious about something. And it could be something completely innocuous that sh you think shouldn't be giving you stress or anxiety. So the even though statement is just telling your brain, your subconscious brain, you know what? I don't care that you feel this way. It's all right to feel this way. And that's why you do the even though statement. So even though I'm feeling stressed and anxious about being on this show, I am okay with that. I'm comfortable with that feeling. And you do that three times. And then you just tap on the points just saying, I'm feeling stressed about being on the show. I'm stressed about being on the show. I'm stressed about being on the show. And you do all of the points. And then you take that measurement again. If you listen to other people do tapping, um, there's an app I share with my clients, and they tend to do a lot of, say, a lot of different things through the tapping process. They'll say, you know, oh, you're stressed to be on this show. It really makes you anxious because you sometimes don't know what to say. And so, you know, the stress on this show, and they like do like a whole conversation basically on tapping. You don't have to do that. that that gets people like really anxious about even trying tapping. <laughs> just say, I'm stressed. You can even just say, I'm stressed. You don't even have to say on the show. You could just say, oh, the stress, so much stress. This is just stressful. Stress, stress, stress. And your brain already knows that you mean the stress about the show. Mm -hmm. 
So it's really, it doesn't have to be as complicated as that. Just I'm, I'm okay that I have this feeling, even though I have this feeling, I'm comfortable with that. I accept it. And then I'm, I'm stressed. That's the, it's really can be that simple. And you don't have to do multiple. You can do just one thing like we did with the breathing and take another measurement. And if you still have anxiety, then do it again. Just repeat and just do it once. You don't have to tap 15 rounds at once. Just tap once, see how you feel. Repeat if you need to, two or three times. Get that anxiety level. You want it to be in the, you know, two, three or lower. Uh, and the more you do it, the more your anxiety and stress will come down. And I'm sure as if it, if it feels nice, keep, keep doing it. It's obviously uh, working. I know how important skin to skin contact is in general, just from all of my background in physical therapy. Not only is, it, is there the, the energetic thing that some people might talk about, but there, there's just a chemical thing that happens. When it comes to sort of the collarbones, the under the arm, I, I know it's going to be harder for people to necessarily do skin on skin. Uh, but would you say that if possible, so maybe if you're doing this for for sleep and you're kind of like, whatever, you're not, you're, you've taken off your clothes, if you're not going to do a whole lot of pajamas, I don't wear pajamas when I sleep that might be a better time doing the skin to skin because everything else on your face, on your head, it is more so of the, of the skin to skin. And I, I personally think that's, that's better. Do you have an opinion on that? Actually, I don't have an opinion on that. I hadn't even thought about that. Um, and mostly because, you know, under the arm, like the collarbone, depending on the shirt you're wearing, you can usually get a skin to skin contact with. But the end of the arm would be very difficult to get skin to skin on a regular basis. <laughs> yeah. But I do have another tip, though, for sleeping. If you're in the middle of the night or lying in bed and having difficulty sleeping, you can also do the finger squeeze. So just squeezing your fingertips on either side of your nail. So that, that first knuckle on either side of your nail, you can squeeze through each of your fingers, including your thumb on both hands. The same acupressure points um, that are attached to all the other acupressure points that we're using. So this one is another one you can use in a meeting with your hands under the table. Um, you can be squeezing your fingers to help reduce or sitting in traffic, you know, or the grocery store, the lineup's really long. You can just give your fingers a quick little squeeze just to like, okay, you know what? I don't need to be so stressed about this. This is life. <laughs> So that's another one I use. And at night, I tend to tell my clients, you know, just remind yourself, you don't need to think about whatever it is you're thinking about. You're going to think about it tomorrow. Time to sleep. And squeeze your fingers. <laughs> and is this a, um, a sustained squeeze or is this kind of like a pulsating squeeze, kind of like the tapping? Yeah, I do pulsating. Pulsating. Squeeze. Okay. Yeah. Just that's I, I instinctively started doing that. And I thought, well, maybe uh, it's it's a whole. Okay. And it, it does. It, it feels nice. And there's there's sort of a, a rhythm with it. Um, we've gotten several times on the show into discussion of uh, ADHD, neurodivergence, some of those things. And I know that stemming is, is something important. A lot of times that's usually a very kind of repetitive task. And so with the tapping, with this kind of squeezing, it's almost it's it's seeming to tick off a lot of different other boxes of it can be very, very helpful in that sense. So in order to help yourself sleep, is this something that you're doing in bed or is this something you do just before bed? Because bed is for sleeping, not not for tapping. Or how, how do you how do you go about doing that? Yeah, well, so one of the things I, I take my clients through um, something I call your daily stressors exercise. So every day writing down any of the things that might have caused you some stress that day. So, and because I talk about psychological stress versus physical stress and how psychological stress gives you the same stress response, the increased adrenaline and cortisol, but a psychological stressor, your brain doesn't understand when it's over. You know, physical stressor, yeah, you survived the physical threat. Your, your brain goes, okay, that's over, and it releases the cortisol. The psychological stressor, you know, getting in a fight with your partner, yelling at your kids, nasty social media comments, um, something goes wrong at work, those psychological stressors, your conscious brain might say, okay, I'm done with that, I apologize, you know, it's it's over. The subconscious brain goes, uh-uh, uh, yeah, wait a minute, I want to think about this some more, right? So here's an example. 
have you ever done anything as a, as a kid or a young adult where when you think about it today, you go, oh, God, I can't believe I did that. I'm so embarrassed, right? You have those things? That's a psychological stressor that just like rears its ugly head. Every once in a while, it'll come up and you'll go, Ee! and you get that shot of adrenaline and cortisol into your system, right? So what I try to encourage people to do every day is just write down everything that caused them stress. They can think about work, relationships, finances, health. Think about the different stress emotions, any emotion other than really happy. You know, so when you're sad, embarrassed, frustrated, irritated, angry, like all those emotions are all part of that stress response. So just write down everything that happened. And then I tell people, okay, so read through that list now. And anything that gives you that immediate gut check, put a check mark beside it. And those things that give you that immediate gut check right now are things that your brain are more likely to bring up sometime in the middle of the night or during the night, maybe not that night, maybe another night, but they're more likely to cause you additional stress. But they're also the things that have kept your cortisol level elevated. And cortisol is really bad for a lot of things, including reducing deep sleep. So making your sleep lighter and more easily disrupted and less restful. So those things that give you that gut check, those are the things you tap on. So even though I got that email and it really pissed me off, I'm okay with that right now. You know, that email was just really, oh man, I just want to punch that guy in the head. <laughs> but I'm okay with that right now and then just tap on it. And I really do recommend you do that every day. And one of the good things about tapping is the more you work on these things, the fewer and fewer those things will start to bother you in the future. So when you get that email from that person, anybody in the future, if you've tapped on it a few times, your brain is more adept at releasing from that emotion. So for me, for example, I do find like um, some of my relationships that I haven't worked on specifically because I've done so much other tapping work, I don't get the same emotional response around those people anymore. That's the advantage to tapping. It really helps you remove the emotion from things, whether you've experienced them already or if you experience them in the future. So that's the what I love about tapping. So yeah, I, I would recommend you do that. You know, take an hour before bed and get into a routine, work on your stressors, write your to-do list so it doesn't keep you awake at night. Give yourself some time to relax, rest, get into sleep mode, then get into bed. And be turning out your light within 30 minutes of getting into bed. So whether you, if you read for 15 minutes in bed as part of your relaxation technique, that's fine. Just turn out the lights within the 30 minutes so you can go to sleep. But then in the middle of the night, if you're, or like, are you struggling to go to sleep? You know, get up and read, maybe finger squeeze to remind yourself that you can, whatever it is that's spinning out in your mind, you can think about it tomorrow or you'll remember to do it tomorrow or whatever it is. It's time to sleep. Go back into a relaxation technique and then try to sleep again. And same in the middle of the night. So the rule of thumb is 30 minutes. So mm -hmm. if it's taking you more than 30 minutes to go to sleep, do something relaxing and try to go back to sleep. Same with in the middle of the night, you're awake more than 30 minutes, get up, do something relaxing, try to go back to sleep. You wake up in the morning, you want to be getting out of bed within 30 minutes of waking up, like 30 minutes is your rule. And that doesn't mean watching the clock, though. That's another thing, too. Don't watch the clock. Just go in your best guess judgment. I've been trying for a while. It's time to relax some more and then go back to sleep. It's interesting how much uh, of what you're saying, I almost kind of naturally have done and have just learned from my body uh, in terms of the the 30 minute is it, it happens rarely. It, it may be once every couple months is I'll wake up in the middle of the night and then I can't seem to go to sleep. And usually my, my rule is about 30 minutes. If for 30 minutes, I can't seem to go to sleep. I usually get up and go work or some, whatever, whatever is that thing that's keeping me up or maybe that I'm thinking about. I'm just going to go and do it uh, at that point because I'm not, well, I'm not sleeping. Uh, and the funny part is within most likely within 20 minutes, rarely do I stay up for hours within 20 minutes of doing that thing. My body goes, Oh, we're done with this. We don't want to do this right now. Let's, let's go to sleep. And I also really like you talking about 
taking that hour of kind of like the pre-sleep ritual as part of it, yes, relax. But I think the other piece that people miss is plan for the day ahead so that you get all your worries out so that you're not thinking, I have to remember to, I have to remember to. You did, you already put it down um, and you've kind of uh, gotten it out. Something that you mentioned, and I'm sure you're asked this possibly even more than how many hours to sleep is uh, you mentioned about cortisol. Cortisol is is important in waking us up in the morning. It's not uh, good to have high levels of throughout the day. But the other thing that people use to wake themselves up in the morning is caffeine. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about caffeine? I, I know about kind of the half-life, when you should stop drinking caffeine throughout the day, but just give us the rundown of how you advise people around the use of caffeine. Yeah, so well, caffeine obviously is a stimulant. It's meant to like give you a jolt within about 15 minutes of drinking it. So, you know, that's why people middle of the afternoon are like, so first of all, naturally, everybody, 100% of people around two, three o'clock hit a slump. So most people are ready to grab that caffeine. Um, so it's not really great for you, though, at that time of day, because it is six to 12 hours to metabolize. Most people think it's six, but it could be as much as 12 hours. And the older you get, the harder it is for you to metabolize caffeine. So I tell people, you know, two to three cups of coffee at the most, you know, stop by noon or you can experiment. For me, I know it's three o'clock. Like if I drink caffeine after three o'clock, I'm not sleeping that night. So you can experiment a little bit to see where, where it is for you. I tend to stop drinking by one, um, you know, and it normally by noon. But there is this half-life too, right? It takes um, six to 12 hours for it to hit that half-life. So then you still have caffeine in your system even after six to 12 hours because of that half-life. So that's another thing to keep in mind. So I do have some clients that say I absolutely cannot drink caffeine at all. So really, it's your metabolism is affected by a number of things, um, age, your health, um, genetics, all kinds of how you eat and take care of your body, like what you're doing throughout the day, how physically active you are. There's a number of things that affect metabolism and how you metabolize different things. So really, it's use your best judgment of what works for you. Um, but really, just keep it in the morning. Keep it limited and you're less likely to have an effect on you at night. Something that I practice, and I don't know if you have uh, any insight into this, is that no caffeine for the first hour because your body's using cortisol for that first hour to wake you up. And um, at least in the minimal amount of research that I've done, it's something along the lines of if you start relying on caffeine, your body goes, oh, cortisol doesn't either it's going to use cortisol over caffeine and it's going to be just saying, OK, caffeine doesn't really do much for us. So then when you take caffeine, otherwise it goes, OK, then that's not really going to wake you up. Um, I, I don't know if I've necessarily experienced that now. It's just a habit at this point of where when I wake up, I don't go for the coffee. I know it's going to be now I go for the water. Um, I think that's that's important. Just start off with water. And a lot of times I'm plenty awake and two, three hours later, I don't I don't even need the coffee, but I just love the taste of coffee. I'll be honest. Mm -hmm. It's far more about the taste. We drink a lot of decaf in the house just because we love the taste of coffee more than we need the caffeine mm -hmm. of it all. But since we mentioned stimulants, we also have to talk possibly about alcohol uh, and that kind of maybe danger of where people go, yeah, you know, I just like having a little nightcap. I like having some alcohol because it helps me sleep. Does it really help us sleep? Does it make us think that we're sleeping better, but we're actually, it's more of a sedative in the sense because we're not actually getting the same rest. Where do we stand with alcohol as a sleep aid? Yeah. Well, you know, back in old times, <laughs> don't ask me how long ago that is, but um, they used to prescribe a nightcap to help people sleep. Like that was the sleep um, advice. But really, alcohol decreases deep sleep, and it also causes something called REM rebound. Now, REM rebound is basically if you are restricted from getting REM sleep for whatever reason, if you're not getting the proper REM sleep, your brain tries to make up REM sleep 
by increasing the amount of time you spend in REM sleep, but the REM rebound usually results in really intense and often nightmarish dreams. So people that are prone to having nightmares are likely not getting a proper amount of REM sleep throughout the night or getting this, end up in this REM rebound. Now, when it comes to alcohol, it takes about an hour to an hour and a half to metabolize one ounce of alcohol. And then you have minor withdrawal effects that last for two to four hours after that. And so you're really, it, it's really not that great for sleep. It might, if you drink enough, you'll pass out and you'll feel like you slept really well. But once you wake up from that pass out phase, a lot of people have this really interrupted, inconsistent um, difficulty sleeping. And that's the alcohol. That's the, the wearing off of the alcohol. That's the REM rebound. That's the reduced deep sleep. It's all of those things that are affecting your sleep. You end up just in really light stage one and two sleep instead of going into your really deep three, four, and REM five sleep. So it's not, and, and that's another thing that takes some experimentation. If you're somebody that's a regular drinker, like, you know, I have my couple of glasses of wine every night. If I hit that third glass of wine, I know I'm not going to sleep. I also make sure that I'm done drinking alcohol, you know, a couple of hours before I go to bed. So I give myself more time to metabolize and get through the withdrawal effects so it doesn't affect my sleep as much. But I do know when I don't drink at all, I sleep way better. <laughs> okay. Experimentation and, and self-awareness as in mm -hmm. so many things in life. Uh, I think that we eventually have to come to the to the elephant in the room, if you would, and uh, that which is social media, uh, which is this this constant of being on our phones, on our devices, which is exposing us to more and more light. Before we jump into how that's affecting our sleep, um, I did a little bit of a dive into your social media, um, and the very first about four years ago, a little over four years ago, your very first post on Facebook is as a view from kind of a, a, a corner window um, of something. But I, the second post, which I found a little bit more interesting is from a book. And it's a, from a book, uh, uh, Palaces for People. And you were ba it was basically about this idea that a lot of the areas where younger kids uh, and, and generally people could socialize and get together, like libraries or just these these bigger areas are becoming less and less and so a lot of times kids are now going to social media uh, a lot of people are going to social media because we can't interact with people quite as much it's not as available to us and that we shouldn't be judging our teenagers for doing something like that and truthfully even adults nowadays for doing something like that especially now with the pandemic when you can't it's, it's limited limited of how much physically we can go out and interact and the irony of that entire thing was that uh, seemingly after that post, shortly after, uh, in uh, 2019, you took an 18-month hiatus from social media. Um, and so tell us about the hiatus. What, what was the reasoning for, for taking the break? Um, did you feel that it affected your sleep uh, in, in a better or worse way? You're obviously back on it now as entrepreneurs. We kind of have to be on it uh, to a degree. But can you walk us through all of that for you? Yeah, well, okay. So I wear a Fitbit. By the way, I do not recommend for people who are having trouble sleeping to rely on a device like a Fitbit or an Apple Watch um, and how it, your sleep is going because one of the problems that we have as insomniacs is we have a misperception about how much sleep we're getting. So I don't recommend it. I'm just going to use it because it actually got me to the point where I was like, I need to go off social media. A Fitbit, if you've been inactive for two hours, it assumes that you are asleep. And then it starts recording from those two hours, your sleep pattern. One day, I was sitting on my couch, scrolling through social media. For so long, my Fitbit thought I was asleep. And I saw that and I went, oh my God. This is terrible. I I need to stop social media. It was almost I think it was later that day. I was like, I'm I'm just done. I turned off all my notifications, all my badges, everything that had to do with social media. I hid it in a folder on like the second or third of my homepage so it wouldn't distract me. And because this is part of the problem with social media is that little yellow red 
dot shows up with, oh, you've got 15 notifications. I better see what's happening on social media. And like, you just, you can't get away from it. It's like this, it's like a trigger. It's a trigger that something's happening and I need to know what it is right now. That FOMO, all of that, the fear of missing what's happening. And that's where I was. As soon as that little red dot showed up or it popped up on my home screen, I needed to see what was happening. And because I got into that scrolling, 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 and literally not stopping and reading much, not interacting, just absorbing, consuming the information, nothing else in my life was happening at that time. To the point where my Fitbit's like, oh, you must be asleep. You're so inactive. You must be sleeping. And it was really, actually a really great break. And the only reason why I went back on social media was because I was started this business and that's the only reason why I started my social media accounts again I don't know if I would have I I mean during that 18 months you know people would be saying to me oh so and so did this or so and so had a baby or this happened or oh yeah you're not on Facebook you you didn't see that so I had to get news the old-fashioned way people had to actually phone me or text me and tell me (laughs) um so it really was a great like I'm, I'm going to say experiment, but it wasn't really an experiment. I wasn't trying to experiment. I was just trying to be more engaged in my life and staying off of this rat race of scrolling through a whole bunch of stuff that I didn't even care about. And did it affect my sleep? Well, at that time, I, I was terrible insomniac. So I, I can't know for sure if that would have made a difference for me or not. However, I do know one of the strategies for helping people get back on track with um, their insomnia is to do what's called sleep restriction. So shrinking up their night. So going to bed later and getting up earlier for a short amount of time to get yourself back on track. And when I'm trying to stay up past what would normally be my bedtime, I will sometimes use social media to keep me awake. Because I can scroll for hours when I'm nodding off or having difficulty staying awake. I can scroll through social media awake for that and type for like an hour, two hours if I needed to. And that'll keep my brain engaged long enough to get me through that falling asleep stage. So, yeah, that's the thing. with so And social media, the other thing. So there's a couple of things that cause problems for people um, with sleep and social media. So. Lots of people think, you know, the blue light, yeah, blue light can affect melatonin production. I don't think that's as bad for you as the engagement of your brain in what you're reading on social media. It's something like, you know, you're, maybe, you know, six seconds or three seconds or something like that that you need to be, um, is your attention span that's that's what i'm trying to get to so it's like three seconds now or it used to be nine now it's seven and then it's three and so like that constant engagement keeps you going you know reading new things seeing new things um worried about missing out on something all of that stuff keeps your brain active and engaged and to sleep your brain needs to completely relax and shut itself down so that it can do its job, which is get rest. So when you're actively engaged in the social media, that is really affecting your brain's ability to to shut down and get ready to go to sleep at night. I find that's more important to understand than to worry about the blue light. Yeah, blue light could affect you, but really it's getting your brain disengaged from thinking and acting i i think that is very very true especially what i've been noticing with just people in general coupling it with this point of people are bad at being bored um we are so instantly bored as soon as we go off the phone and you're right it's the 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 attention span is so short that we need to get into it so when you're saying 30 minutes Turn everything off 30 minutes before sleep. 30 minutes, that is like a year in attention spans of thinking of, oh, I can't look at something. I can't think about something. I, I Turning it off, how could I possibly do it? I think that there is, I mean, we could talk about this for hours of 
are people also getting away from it because they don't want to be with their own thoughts because they have their stressors, their fears, their anxieties, and they're going, no, 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 no. Let me escape into this quick thing that's that's easily distracting me from so much of that. that all all sorts of various different topics um, around it. And I, I I do think that if people can be a little bit more engaging, you could, if you have a lot of self-discipline, use social media to train yourself up and go, okay, I'm going to engage with all this content. I'm actually going to participate into it. But unfortunately, the vast majority of people just scroll, scroll, scroll. My question is then if we, for example, my wife loves using uh, YouTube. She'll put on YouTube videos to help her fall asleep. I personally do the same thing sometimes when I know I'm going to have a hard time falling asleep. It's very specific to just certain YouTube videos. They just help me fall asleep very, very quickly. Good, bad, unsure, maybe try to get away from it. What are your thoughts? My thought is, if that's the thing that you need to get yourself relaxed to go to sleep, then use it. Mm -hmm. I don't ever want to really, it's not really so much about changing your habits unless they are not working for you. Mm -hmm. So if that's just, you know, if it if it's not really helping you go to sleep, then why, then don't do that. But if it is something that you need to do to help you go to sleep, just like watching TV, in bed before you go to sleep, it's fine. Just set a timer. So if you fall asleep while it's going, it shuts itself off. You don't ever have to, you don't have to worry about shutting it off. You don't have to think about it. It's not going to wake you up later in the night. You know, that's fine. The point is to find a habit that will help you relax, get your brain into relax, stress-free, ready to sleep mode. Mm -hmm. So I compare it like I don't know how long ago this was, 10, 15 years ago, you know how they used to talk about using your commute to shut off work so you could be home and be present with your family? You need to do the exact same thing at night. You need to have this buffer zone where you shut down being active, awake, engaged, and ready to go to sleep. And so at least 30 minutes of just really Shutting down what's happening during the day, relaxing yourself, getting yourself prepared so that when you get into bed, you're already in that relaxed state and ready to go to sleep. And that could be reading. It could be building a puzzle, doing some sort of, you know, hobby, watching a neutral TV show. This is something I always tell people, you know, don't watch a horror flick if that keeps, you have to keep the lights on afterwards. Don't, you know, watch an engaging, documentary if that's going to keep you your brain going don't have you know emotional or intense conversations I had a client her and her husband would get into bed and that was the only time they had alone and they'd have all these conversations and then she couldn't go to sleep well you're too active right you, you need to do these things that are preparing you to slow down be relaxed and then you can be ready to go to sleep so that's really and what it is that makes you relax, that's different for everybody. For me, it's not TV. The TV keeps me awake. But reading, 15 minutes of reading and I'm like falling asleep on my book. So whatever it is for you, find that thing and do it. <laughs> I resonate very strongly with the the uh, the intense conversations at night. It seems to be every single time. We've gotten to the point, my wife, um, she likes to go to sleep very late. Um, we're talking like one to 2 AM most all times she's tried many of the different sleep schedules, all that. She seems to always revert to it. I'm, I'm a morning bird, um, or whatever, whatever they're called. But, um, I, I wake up at six usually pretty naturally, but inevitably when, when she goes in, when I'm getting ready for bed and I get in bed, she goes in and conversations start. And I always go, can you, we, we can have these conversations, but please, you're not allowed to be in the bedroom when I'm going to sleep because you're going to keep me up forever. Um, from my understanding, what you're saying, those 30 minutes, ideally also not in the bed when you're doing whatever it is, do it outside of the bed and then go to the bed to fall asleep. Is that right? Well, I mean, you can, I, yes, I would say yes. You want to give yourself 30 minutes before you get into bed to, you know, get yourself relaxed and shutting down the day if it if you spend another 30 minutes in bed 
reading or watching TV because that's the thing that puts you to sleep, that's okay too. Mm -hmm. But give yourself at least 30 minutes before you get into bed to get yourself ready. And ideally, you're not even getting into bed until you're ready for sleep. So until you're sleepy or drowsy, that means nodding off, excessive yawning, like your body is prepared to go to sleep when you close your eyes. That's the ideal time to get into bed. But yeah, if you want to take that extra 30 minutes in bed to read or, or watch a little bit of TV and then, and then go to sleep, that's okay too. But give yourself some time before getting into bed. Mm -hmm. And given off of that, I, I think you, you already answered the question that I had prepped is the, uh, the idea of sometimes almost like pre falling asleep on the couch or wherever it might be, and then migrating over to the bed once you've sometimes couches are just more comfortable um but nothing against that because that's just sort of warming you up and then okay the bed is for sleeping and that's just one of those other routines as long as uh you don't maybe fall asleep sleep four hours on the couch and then in the middle of the night transfer uh how do you feel about falling asleep on couches or it's sleep it doesn't matter <laughs> um okay so i guess it depends on what time that's happening mm. you know so my dad it was so funny he's like yeah, I can't sleep past 4 a.m. And I said, well, Dad, you're sleeping on the couch at 8 o'clock. So by 4 a.m., you've already had eight hours of sleep. What more do you want? <laughs> so, yes, it comes down to what um, what time is it and what time do you normally go to bed and what time do you normally get up? So, you know, I, I don't recommend if you're falling asleep on the couch at 6 o'clock. By the way, so this is actually a good thing that we're talking about this. I do think naps are good. And especially for people that are really struggling with your sleep, if you need a nap, that's okay. Just make sure it's before four o'clock and you're not napping for more than 20 to 30 minutes. So, you know, that's okay. So if you're falling asleep on the couch at six, it's not ideal. <laughs> not only is it not ideal, it's going to really disrupt your sleep that night. So um, falling asleep on the couch right at bedtime, not so bad. As soon as you realize that you're asleep, go to bed. Or if you find yourself like nodding off and can't stay awake, go to bed. That's that's your signal it's time for bed. As long as it's close to your bedtime. You don't want to be two or three hours before bedtime doing that and then letting yourself sleep because that'll disrupt your sleep. It'll make it harder for you once you do wake up to go to sleep and it'll make it harder for you to sleep through the night soundly. So, you know, just be aware of that. And for anybody, if you're having trouble staying awake, you know, I used to do this all the time. About six o'clock, I'd be on the couch and I'd be having a nap. If you're struggling to stay awake and it's not time for bed, there's a couple of options. The most effective one is to get active. Get up, do some jumping jacks, go for a quick walk around the block. You know, what you want to do is just sort of get your body moving and sort of boost that energy. Um, and the other option would be to just like start a really good conversation with somebody, get on the phone, talk to somebody. That's another way to get you past that sort of stunt. Exercise is best, but, you know, conversation would help too. So, I love that so just keep of, yourself. Yeah. yeah. But keep, keep, keep yourself active, keep yourself moving. Don't allow yourself to fall asleep too early. Um uh, again, you pre uh, preempted my question. You you foresaw it. Yes. And I love that you brought in movement. I think that's a, a kind of a stereotype at this point is in the evening. That's it. We don't move. We just we sit around and I'm all about movement. So I go, no, I don't do intense exercise. I'm not saying go do a CrossFit workout or something like that or sprint. But movement, absolutely, it's great, it's wonderful. Uh, maybe even playing board games or whatever else it might be. That's what we end up uh, sort of doing. But I find it very hard to sit still. But that's just me. Uh, the cross I have to bear of, oh, oh not sitting too much. Uh, if people want to get in touch with you, if people want to learn more about what you do, maybe even work with you for those six weeks so they can finally get some amazing sleep, how do they find out more about you? How do they get in touch with you? Yeah, well, you can go to my website, lanawalshcoaching.ca. Um, there is, well, lots of information. There's even a quiz on there to find out if you even need to work with me. Um, you can take that quiz and find out if you have insomnia and what level of insomnia you have. Uh, of course, there's a, 
a link on there to book a meeting with me. I do a completely free consultation and sleep assessment. Um, feel free to reach out to me there. I'm on all the social, not all the social, <laughs> LinkedIn, Instagram, and Facebook as Lana Walsh Coaching. You can find me on any of those under that name as well. And just and just follow me and learn more about what I, how I share with people, what I share with people. Wonderful. And we'll have the links in the show notes so people can click right over to all of that. Uh, last thing, I know we've covered a lot, predominantly sleep and insomnia, but is there anything else that, that you'd like to kind of leave the audience off with? Well, you know, it's funny because this was um, your podcast is about, you know, keeping movement and, and exercise and all of that. And we never did actually talk about that. Um, and one thing that, you know, I, I just sort of touched on it when you're talking about your experience of having the parasite in your eye, about how it can affect your body. And one of the things that I talk about with people, when I'm talking to people with insomnia, they are so stressed and anxious about their sleep that one of the things I like to share with people is let's not be so anxious about all the other things that get affected by your sleep. And one of those is your health. Because there are a number of things that affect health that are correlated to sleep, but not a direct cause and effect of sleep. So for example, your health is affected by your genetics. It's affected by your environment. Do you have access to clean water? Do you have access to healthy food? It's affected by um, your how much movement you're getting into your day. And sleep does play a role in some of those things. For example, if you're not sleeping well, you don't have the energy to work out. So yes, okay, so sleep would maybe affect your ability to exercise. But there's so much more that goes into whether or not you're going to be a healthy person, whether you're going to get cancer or heart disease or all of those things that is not just because of sleep. So that's one thing I do like to leave with your audience is that because this is a health podcast to, you know, your sleep is important, but don't give it all of that weight that lots of people do. It's just one part of the puzzle and your stress, your activity, your healthy eating, your genetics, your environment, all of it combined is what goes whether or not you yourself are going to be healthy. So if you can keep in mind all of those things and still do eat right, exercise, and, you know, have clean water, all of those things, if you can access all of that, your sleep is just one piece of the puzzle. So that's what I want to leave your audience with. You know, being active is best. If you're having trouble sleeping and you're having trouble being active, it's okay. That's just a short-term thing. Come work with someone like me and I'll help you get back on track. But that's not the only way to it. doesn't make you too anxious about your sleep. That's the most important thing. We don't want you to be any more anxious about your sleep. We want you to do your best to sleep as well as you can and take care of your health in other areas where you can. So that's what I want to do. Lovely. And and what I love about that that entire answer and that that concept is all those things also intermingle. So in the sense of where exercise and good diet improve your sleep, good sleep also helps your exercise and also helps your, your diet and your body to function well with the food and your digestion. You even mentioned digestion before um, with when you're not getting enough sleep. So it, it all all those little pieces all intermingle as well. I know we didn't get to some other things like curling. Um, so, but I, I think we've just gotten through so much really important information and thank you so much because I got more out of this than I ever anticipated. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much for being on the show. Well, thank you so much for having me on the show. It's been a wonderful conversation. I hope that you found this episode beneficial. I hope that it didn't put you to sleep, but gave you some tools and ways that you can get to sleep later today. I know that I've been using the tapping. That really helps, especially when I'm uh, very anxious or have had maybe too much caffeine. It just brings me down. It's just, it's a very nice technique, um, as well as the breathing. Um, for me personally. If you found this helpful, one of the best ways that you can support me is 
rating and reviewing this podcast wherever you are or leaving a comment because that's what it lives and dies by. Apple Podcasts is the best place, but honestly, anywhere that you find it, interaction is everything. And I want to spread these messages to more and more people. And as always, until next time.